I send the best good afternoon greetings to Korea. You have heard the title already, Fair Data Infrastructure and Artificial Intelligence in Material Science. As indicated in this transparency, data have structure and in big data of material science and engineering, the interesting materials occupy somewhat small areas. In this talk, I will discuss two key points. First, I will address that the data, that data are an important raw material of the 21st century, but without a full characterization, data are actually worthless. How can we turn data into knowledge and into value? It is not just important, but it is necessary that data are comprehensively annotated. And, or this is, that means they need to be characterized in terms of metadata and possibly also ontologies. Only then, and this is the second and main theme of my talk, data can be refined and analyzed by artificial intelligence methods. What I'd like to discuss in this talk is part of a bigger, mostly European project that is called NOMAD, the Novel Materials Discovery Center of Excellence. It started 2013 with the NOMAD repository, which initially addressed up initial computational material science by inviting colleagues to upload their data without any barriers. That is, the data are accepted as they are produced by the employed computer code. In fact, NOMAD does not ask for uploading results, but we request the full input and full output files. No polishing, no adjustments are needed. The NOMAD repository went online 2014. The community uses about 40 different computer codes. These are very different codes. They use different concepts, different conventions, different units. They are all served by NOMAD, and if new codes arise, we are happy to include them as well. Our colleagues and friends from the US, in particular AFLOW, Materials Project, OQMD, and others take part in this uploading activity, and several colleagues from Korea contribute as well. This is a community effort, and many people help with developments or just with suggestions on what needs to be improved. At this point, NOMAD is the biggest data store in computational material science. It holds more than 108 million results and more than 10 billion quantities. The simple idea or motivation behind the project was and is that sharing advances science. There is still one important aspect where we need to change the scientific culture. This addresses in particular the experimentalists. Typically, researchers in science and engineering work on very special somewhat narrow research projects. If studies are deemed not relevant for the focus, they are not documented, not shared, and simply discarded. This is a big mistake. Nomad argued from the very beginning that studies that turn out to be not interesting for one special research focus or special application may well be important for different purposes. We formulated this as follows, recycle the waste, enable repurposing. Obviously, such recycling and data sharing will not work when everyone keeps the data on their local workstations. We need a fair, efficient research data infrastructure. This is what the NOMAD laboratory and the NOMAD Center of Excellence have achieved. Initially for up initio computational material science, but it is now extended towards force field studies, experimental studies, and since a few days, people also started to upload data obtained from calculations on quantum computers. The entry door of the NOMAD laboratory is the purple segment, that is the repository which holds the raw data. NOMAD is then passing, converting, and normalizing these input and output files and these normalized data then form what we call the NOMAD archive. The archive can be searched by anyone via APIs, and it can be searched and visualized directly 
like NOMAD encyclopedia. And the data can be used for further analysis by the NOMAD Artificial Intelligence Toolkit. The repository and archive together are what is now called FAIR, that is data are findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable by the community and by everyone. NOMAD is even more than FAIR, at least in the sense of what is described in the famous above noted FAIR paper. We request that colleagues who upload the files, their files, identify themselves. That this is like a publication. However, for downloading data or files, people do not need to register or to identify themselves. With the download, they just accept the CC BY license. Our alternative and even more advanced interpretation of the acronym FAIR is that data are findable and that they are converted and normalized and offered as ready for an AI analysis. I will now focus on the green component of this pentagon, that is I will discuss some AI concepts and tools. So what is the challenge and in fact also the opportunity in material science? The number of possible materials is practically infinite. We know a lot of materials, but in fact, compared to infinite, infinity, we know very, very little. That means there is a lot of materials out there which very likely perform better in applications than the materials that we know today. As there are so many, there is no way to cover this huge structural and chemical compound space by direct high throughput screening. The interesting materials, that is another point which is very important, are also very few. Very few from this nearly infinite number of possibilities. That means the interesting materials are statistically exceptional. That means, or in our conclusion, that means we should create maps of material properties using AI methods and concepts. We need to identify descriptors, descriptive parameters, we don't know them at the moment, here in this schematic plot D1 and another descriptor D2, and hopefully if we find the right descriptors, the idea is that at the end there is a certain range where we find good superconductors, another range where we find good photovoltaics, and so on. In principle, this map will be, of course, bigger than just two-dimensional. How can we do this? How can we do pattern discovery for uncovering physical characterizations? So here I have, as a basically tutorial uh, uh, picture, uh, some data points. These are material properties as a function of some materials described by some dis material descriptor. Global models for example, machine learning, do the following. One single model is used to describe the whole population. That implies that we minimize the overall prediction error using regularization. Thus, one disregards local details on purpose. A fit, if it's simple, just look then as follows, and that would be the global model. However, The alternative, which we like to emphasize here, is subgroup discovery, uh, brought forward by these two people uh, shown here. Subgroup discovery realizes that there may be more information about the data points, and in this tutorial picture, there may be data points which are blue and data points which are red, which implies we should do the fit in groups independently. And you see the fit is even orthogonal to the previous picture. The way this is done is we find, or we search, and then we find conjunctions. Conjunctions that maximize an appropriate quality function, u times the size times the narrowness, where c in these conjunctions are Boolean statements, which are true or false. So for example, the ionization potential of atom A, I, A minus the ionization potential of atom B divided by IPA must be bigger than 0.3. So we have to find these Boolean conditions and we need 
an utility function u for optimiz optimizing uh, the, the situation. In this way, we find subgroups uh, which aim to recover, uncover specific local properties of the data that are statistically exceptional. Here is another example of the same idea. Uh, we have uh, properties Y, again as a function of the material, labeled by D. And the full curve is a Gaussian regression fit of all the data with the error bar or distribution given by the dashed lines. A global model fitted to the entire data set may be difficult to interpret, and it may well hide or incorrectly describe the actuating physical mechanism. On the other hand, subgroup discovery, as we have said it already, and I show this in a second, are subgroups are statistically exceptional. How to find that? Now, if you look at the data points, you may see actually there is more information. There are, in fact, in this figure, circles and squares. And now we have two identifications of each point. We have the x coordinate, a or b, as a value, and the d coordinate. Now we can ask, are there special uh, groups in, with respect to x and d? And the result is that if, and this is our conjunction sigma for the data point j, if d of this data point is bigger than point 8 and x of this data point belongs to the a group, that seems to be a special group. And you see this here in circled and, and, and blue dashed line, uh, a group which is parallel to the x-axis. In fact, there are several groups which, uh, identified, which are identified by this, but these groups, we believe, deserve special attention. And now I come to very specific examples of this basic concepts. Of course, to do this, we need first feature candidate. What are the candidates, what are the parameters with respect to which we should identify the subgroup? Now, we know that everything in, in, in solid state physics is determined by the many-body Hamiltonian, that means by the atomic positions and by the nuclear, nuclear numbers and by the number of electrons. And for statistic mechanics, in addition, there's temperature and pressure. This determines, in principle, everything, but it does not really tell us anything about the mechanism. So the features which we should offer and then analyze what size they, they may have will be related to the positions and related to the nuclear numbers, to the chemistry of the atoms, if you want. And they should be easy to calculate because we want to use these features for simple predictions. So, for example, atomic ionization potentials could be a feature, or the spread of the atomic wave function could be another feature. This is what we should do, and with respect to these features, we should find groups uh, which are statistically special. Now, we have done this for several examples. Um, let me just say that the role model of the whole idea is really old. It's a periodic table of the element, but in principle, it's also uh, Ashby plots, uh, which are used in engineering. And we have done this for several systems. For example, for crystal structure prediction, looking at octet binaries, uh, what are the parameters that determine, which are the, what are the atomic parameters that determine the zinc blend structure or the rock salt structure? We looked at transparent uh, metallic systems like aluminum, gallium, indium oxides. We looked at Goldschmidt tolerance factor to find an improvement. Uh, we looked at topological insulators, at heterogeneous catalysis of carbon dioxide, and at classification, identifying uh, from the atomic information if a system will become, if it becomes a solid metallic or insulating. I will now show you two examples. One is the octet semiconductors, the left on the top, and the other one is heterogeneous catalysis. Now, I should say we, we are using usually two different methods. Subgroup discovery is the one which I will use in this talk, but we have another method which is even more powerful but also slightly more complex, that is CISO, sure independent screening and sparsifying operator. This is the combination of symbolic regression and compressed sensing, a type of representation learning, telling us again what are the key parameters of a structure which you find in data, 
in fact, also giving a quantitative description of prediction, predicted values. But because of time and, 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 and didactic reasons, I would just really concentrate today on subgroup discovery. Our toy model for that um, is uh, the zinc blend rock salt examples, which I, example which I like to use for finding the parameters, which are also called the genes of materials properties. This is an old idea. The idea goes back to J.C. Phillips and Jim van Fechten, who in fact tried to understand the reasoning of zinc blender and rock salt structures in simple terms 50 years ago. But they used, in fact, solid state properties. We want something which is not solid state related. Still, so the question is, there are 82 octet binaries, like gallium arsenide, zinc selenide, and so on. 82 octet binaries and sodium chloride. Can we predict, just knowing the atomic properties, if the systems will assume the zinc blender structure or the rock salt structure? So the data which we're using is this information about rock salt and zinc blender. That means the total energy of rock salt and zinc blender. And then we have to maximize a quality function. Utility U, the size of the subgroup should be not too small. We don't want single points. And we want a narrow distribution because that is somewhat the characteristic aspect of a group. The, the, the utility function which we use here is what is called the information gain. Is it different of the entropies, of the information entropies of the full population and the subgroup divided by the entropy of the full population? Where the entropy is defined by pi times logarithm of pi. Uh, in this simple example where we have only two values, namely the value could be one for zinc blender and zero for rock salt. Uh, pi basically is the number of elements of this one uh, well, of, that have the same value. We need candidate features. Here we used 55 features altogether to describe these 82 octet binaries. Again, these are uh, candidates, and we, are, we just have to see which of them will survive. Ionization potential of atom B, electron affinity of atom B, HOMO level of atom B, LUMO level of atom B, the uh, spread of the R, of, of the wave function of the S electron of atom B, that means the, out, the, the position of the outer maximum, the same for the P wave function for the D, all atomic quantities, and the same we're using for atom A, and we're using several other quantities as well, and we're using so-called derived quantities, which are differences or ratios of these quantities. This is what we offer, and then we ask, in these parameters, are there special subgroups? And the answer is, yes, there are. There are several subgroups, and uh, the top subgroups with, with the best performance in this entropy gain is the one which you see here. Uh, the conjunction sigma of the rock, rock salt elements is that Rp of the A atom minus the radius of the P electron of the B atom, three atom values, should be bigger than 0.9 angstrom, and in addition, the uh, radius of the S electron of the A atom should be bigger than 1.22. This gives us, because the, uh, the X and Y axis are in fact these Rp A minus Rp B on the X axis and Rs on the Y axis, gives us this rectangular, and the points which we have calculated are in this rectangular. Circles mean these are um, rock salt structure. Now there is an asymmetry uh, as you see this in, in the equation, but that is, comes from the fact that also our, our data have some asymmetry because we offer gallium arsenide and, and, and zinc selenide, but we do not offer arsenic gallium, which is the same. So we always have the cation on the left side of, of the name of, of the species. In the green box, everything is green and everything is circle. Uh, we have a blue box with uh, slightly different or quite different numbers, it's very little overlap of the blue and, and green box. And in the, green, in the blue box, everything is blue and square. 
That means on this entropy, if you just remember, uh, pi times logarithm pi, pi, everything is circle. That means the entropy or pi is one, and that means the entropy is zero. And the same is true for the group. This is the best you can really achieve. But there are still three materials which are not covered. Magnesium telluride, uh, silver iodide, and copper fluoride. They are slightly outside these regions. Now, if you look at the total energy differences, there the zinc blend and the rock salt structure are very similar. Just the difference is less than, or is of the order of 10 milli electron volts. So, so that, in fact, uh, there is no clear answer even in, in density function theory, which structure these things will assume. So with subgroup discovery, we first get the structures, uh, uh, groups here green and groups here blue, but we also find the parameters which drive uh, uh, this, this process. These could be actuators, but it could be also in fact just facilitators or it should be also things which hinder uh, the formation. This is what we call or what is called the genes of the materials properties. Let me come to a second example. An example which in fact fits very well to this conference, ENGE, namely to the GE, to the green environment, turning greenhouse gases into useful chemicals and fuels. Carbon dioxide is a big problem because it's a very stable molecule and if you put it in the air, it has these uh, important effects on, on the climate. But at some point, I believe CO2 could well be an important raw material because you can use CO2 to form important chemicals you can, or fuels like methane or methanol or other chemicals. You can do this already nowadays um, by catalysis, but so far the catalysis is too inefficient. We need an efficient catalyst to do this and then we simply would not put the carbon dioxide in the air, but we simply would use it for something good. We looked into this uh, by subgroup discovery, identifying new potential catalysts, and we looked into and, uh, and, and considered oxides, because oxides are particularly stable, they are usually not poisonous, and the oxides which we used were oxides with two atoms, A, B, O3, but in fact also with just one, or one atom, like A, O, or B, O2, and, and so on, everything you see here, where the A and B metals or elements are the ones which are listed here. So these are a the lot of different materials which we considered uh, in looking into if these could be good catalysts. In fact, we're not only looking at the uh, elements or at, at these materials, bulk materials, catalysis or heterogeneous catalysis works on surfaces. And that means we have to look at, at the absorption of carbon dioxide at different surfaces and so considering surfaces of many of these materials and all possibly relevant surface sites, we then ask which material and which surface sites are catalytically active. There is an interesting and very useful concept in heterogeneous catalysis, which sometimes goes under the name of the rate limiting step or uh, activation of stable molecules. The problem of CO2, I mentioned that already, is that it is very stable. In fact, it's very stable if it's linear and if it's neutral. We know from the gas phase, if you would charge it, it would form, in fact, an, an angle, and then it would become very reactive. So one concept in heterogeneous catalysis was that if you have a material and carbon dioxide on this material would bind in a way with a smaller angle, this would be a catalytically active or chemically active CO2. You want materials which exactly do that form, go away from the linear molecule to a tilted one. That means the tilt indicates there is a weakening of the bond and because there's a weakening of the bond, this CO2 is doing the chemical reaction. So materials which bind CO2 in a way that the OCO angle is small, these materials would be a good subgroup for catalysis. This was the concept uh, uh, accepted in heterogeneous catalysis, but we felt we should be more general. We should also look for other subgroups because uh, the issue here is not that the angle is 
is, is actually smaller for, uh, away from 180. The issue is we have to weaken the carbon-oxygen bond. And another measure of a weakened bond is that the bond length is bigger. So large CO bond length is another very good uh, indicator of high reactivity. That would be another subgroup. We looked at altogether five different subgroups, but because of time, I only show you these two. And so we look for two different subgroups, identified or defined in the following way by the target property. It could be number one, small OCO angle, or number two. And then we say, in addition to the target property, we want to minimize the width of the target property distribution, the width of the subgroup. We maximize the distance between the median of the target property distribution and that of the whole data set. And we maximize the size of the subgroup, again, because we don't want single point subgroups. Altogether, in this case, we looked at 51 potential features. Now, now the features are not really atomic-like. They now should identify the surface. They should not have any information about the CO2, but they should have information about the clean surface. Because we asked which, surfaces, which surface is really a good catalyst. So the clean, the basic features which we like to identify, the genes of, of this catalytic process, uh, should characterize the clean surface. Here you find our results. Blue is the small OCO, small OCO angle subgroup, and green is the large CO bond length subgroup. Plotted as a function of the angle and the bond lengths. I also included the free molecule values. The free CO molecule has an uh, angle of 180 degrees and, and a bond length of 1.17. If you charge it, it gets a bond angle. And in the free molecule, the angle and the bond lengths are really correlated. So it's really a clear, straight line. On the surface, obviously, you see from the data point, it's no longer correlated. It's not a straight line. It's really distributed significant, with significantly widths. So what is the identification which subgroup discovery gives us? At first for the green subgroup, that means the one with the large CO bond lengths. So we find three parameters identify the green points. The valence band maximum should be uh, smaller than minus 5.14 electron volt with respect to the vacuum. The minimum of the Hirschfeld charges on the cations should be smaller than 0.48 electrons. And the distance to the second nearest cation should be bigger than 2.26 angstrom. I should say carbon dioxide always binds on an oxygen at the surface. Of course, there are several oxygen sites. But, but the sites where the oxygen atom, where it binds to, has a second nearest neighbor, not the nearest, but the second nearest neighbor cation of, of this, uh, under this condition. All these together define the green subgroup. And the blue subgroup is defined by other quantities, uh, by the oxygen P. This is, again, the surface oxygen density of states. It should be bigger. The maximum should be higher than minus 6 electron volt. The distance to the nearest neighbor cation should be bigger than 1.8. And the distance to the second should be bigger than 2.12 angstrom. So different conditions, two different subgroups. We have identified groups which weaken the bond. We haven't really said yet which is a good catalyst of that. Let me address this now. Here you see the number of systems as a function of adsorption energy. We could have also plotted something different, but this was another very nice uh, information for catalysis. The black curve is all the data which we had calculated by DFT. The green curve is our green large CO bond length subgroup. And the blue is the large, the small OCO angle subgroup. So the old idea would have been that the good catalysts are in the blue region. But we say, in principle, the green region can be as important as the blue region is, because both indicate a high reactivity. In fact, we now, after having identified the subgroups by theory, we now look at experiment, because we don't really want and we are not able to calculate the full process of catalysis. Um, we, we look at experiments and we find that most known materials with good catalytic performance, 
belong to the green subgroup. There are a few, very few, because usually bad results are not, not reported. There are few bad performance materials, but none of the bad uh, corresponds to, to, the, to the green one. So the conclusion is that from all possible materials which can come to mind, we say it makes more sense to really look and screen and analyze materials which belong to the green subgroup. That would speed up the process, help us hopefully to find a good catalyst for CO2 activation and turning CO2 into something good. So let me summarize and give you a short outlook. I wanted to emphasize that sharing advances science. Data without full annotation, that is without metadata, are worthless. Annotation, annotation is particularly difficult or challenging for experiments. Uh, you need to identify so much about the sample, about the equipment, about the, the measurement process. For catalysis that has been started recently by Annette Trunschke and Robert Schlögel at the Fritz Haber Institute and others, and there is this paper which just came out towards experimental handbooks and catalysis, which identifies what type of information is needed to, in fact, do a good annotation of experimental catalysis data. Second, uh, NOMAD is fair in the standard sense, but in fact, NOMAD data are also findable and AI ready in this more modern advanced sense. There is some type, so, some type of misconceptions in the field. Uh, I mean, it's not really a mis, it's mis misconception for material science, at least. There is the idea or the statement that more data provide a better description. That is in principle true, but it's not necessarily true in practice in material science because more data give you more data, but most often we find that most of the data which we have are actually irrelevant for the property of interest. And so adding more irrelevant data cannot make it really better to find what you're interested in. The interesting material are often smaller than 0.1% of the whole data set. And that's why we feel something like subgroup recovery is what is needed. This is the first step. I mean, there's still much more to do to find special groups which, are, which have special properties. But I've shown you what we can do already with subgroup discovery. We find interpretable rules. That means we identify conditions that are true or false. We find basic physical features which are interpretable. They impact the properties of interest. And this is what you may call the genes of material properties. And of course, this together gives us the patterns telling us in what range, in what area of the big data space will we find better catalysts or topological insulators or whatever we are interested in. Let me finish with very few words about what we call the NOMAD Artificial Intelligence Toolkit. Uh, this is the web page of the toolkit, uh, work in progress. So what we are doing here is that we uh, present all these uh, tools, these artificial intelligence analysis in terms of Jupyter notebooks. There is one querying the full archive, performing artificial intelligence modeling, and there are several other tools uh, or notebooks uh, on what I showed you, the crystal structures of octets, the carbon dioxides, and so on. We believe that this is a very important step where the field should go. And the reason is that this is, we feel it's also the next level of sharing in the sense that AI models in the literature are often not fully documented with respect to the data and not fully documented with respect to the method. So our request would be publish the data, obviously, but also, in fact, publish the full AI code uh, so that people can repeat it and understand it. For doing this, in terms of Jupyter notebooks, we certainly also offer help. I don't like to close without saying that there are many people who have contributed to what I have discussed. Um, in particular, I like to mention two of them, uh, namely Claudia Draxel, who was particularly important and is important in everything which concerns the infrastructure, the repository archive, the encyclopedia, and more, and Luca Giringelli, who is the key person behind 
metadata, ontologies, and in particular, artificial intelligence. One little warning, or again, not a warning, AI is a very powerful tool. It has a big, big promise that it can help and bring science ahead. But it is a tool. And as every tool, uh, one has to realize that tools are useful if one knows how to use them and for what they can be applied. If this is not understood, they could well do more harm than good. With this, I thank you very much for your attention.